Thank you so much for that beautiful special music. Thank you, Hillary, for reading that verse for us. Um, first, I want to welcome uh, the visitors here. Uh, welcome to my family. I have so much family here today. Um, also, my church family, right? Um, so thankful for all of you. Um, we have other visitors here as well. I think I just met Christine this morning, so welcome to you and your beautiful family. Um, my, my friend Randy over here, welcome. You know, I, one thing about Randy, I met him at the Harvest Festival, and we instantly clicked because I could see and feel the love that he has for his family, and that, uh, that really came out of you from that first conversation that I had, and, and so thank you so much uh, for you and your family to be here today. So happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. It's an honor and a privilege to be up here today. Also, welcome to my aunt and uncle all the way from Florida. I did not expect to see you guys here. <laughs> I love you guys. So good to see you. Yeah, it's a good surprise. <laughs> so I've been working on this sermon for a while now. Um, I wanted to preach about something that I was passionate about. Okay? So I've been working on this for a while, but the devil really tried to attack me the last couple of weeks with just my thought process on this sermon. I just couldn't wrap myself around what I really wanted to say and what I want to talk about. And he just really was attacking my thought process. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. But I just want to pray uh, now for that God to fill me with his spirit. Um, so let us pray. Lord, I ask you to fill me with your spirit. Amen. I ask you to fill this church with your spirit now. I pray that you will guide this sermon and that the words that I speak may be words that your words, God, and not mine. Amen. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so turn with me to our scripture verse in Nehemiah 13. I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Mark, I don't need this thing right. It's kind of like blocking my view a little bit. Um, so we're going to read verses 13, 14, and 20. And it says, Therefore I position men among the lower parts of the wall, at the openings, and I set the people according to their what? Their families, with their swords and their spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, fight for your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Verse 20. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Amen. What he's saying here is that if you'll fight for your family, God will fight for you. The title of my sermon is Something Worth Fighting For. Our families are worth fighting for. Amen. Our family's salvation is worth fighting for. Amen. The devil and society are attacking our families and our homes right now, right? Amen. It seems like the, the attack of the 21st century is upon our homes and our families. And we have to understand and that the ideas and the values that we stand for uh, are worth fighting for. I'm thankful for my family, right? The happiest times of our lives are usually with our family. And family as we know it between a man and a woman and children is worth fighting for. And we have to take a stand for our kids. Nehemiah encountered opposition in rebuilding the wall. Did he stop building it? No, right? Let's go to Nehemiah 2, verse 20. And he says there, he's talking to his enemies there, and he says, the God of heaven, then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right to claim in Jerusalem. Nehemiah was telling his enemies, you have no right here. We're going to rebuild this wall. 
We're going to fight for our families, and our God will make us prosper. Now I want to go kind of through some rapid succession here at some verses I have. I have about eight verses, so I'm not going to give you a chance to look them all up. I'm going to put them up here. <laughs> the first one is going to be Exodus 14, 13, 14, and 25. And this is uh, when the Israelites were fleeing the Egyptians through the Red Sea. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see no more. The Lord will fight for you, and he shall hold your peace. Verse 25, this is the Egyptians uh, it says, he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. We can see again the Lord fighting for his people, right? Uh, Deuteronomy 1, and 30. This is when the Israelites sent 12 spies to the land of the giants, right? And the Israelites were scared. And, they, and the verse says, then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. All right, Deuteronomy 3.22. This is, uh, this is uh, God talking to Moses. And he says, you must not fear them for the Lord your God himself fights for you. Deuteronomy 2.22. 20 verse 4, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to save you. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 15, 17, and 29, this is when the Israelites were going to go against the Moabites and the Ammonites. Uh, and he says here, and he said, listen, all of you Judah and your inhabitants of, Is of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid or dismayed. Because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And you, you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or dismay, or be dismayed. Tomorrow you go out against them, for the Lord is with you. In verse 29, we can see kind of the result of this. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. Again, God is fighting for his people. Joshua 23.3, this is Joshua's farewell address. Shortly after this, uh, he, he actually died. Um, and it says, you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he has what? Promised. Promised. Two more here. In Joshua 4, 10, 14. This is when the Lord God made the sun stand still. And there has been no day like that bef before or after that the Lord heeded the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. We have a God that can even make the sun stand still. Right? This next verse doesn't have too much to do with mine, but as I studied, I just saw this verse and I thought it was so cool. I never read this verse before. It talks about the majesty and the glory and the power of God. In Job 26, verse 7, it says, He stretches out the north over empty space, and he hangs the earth on nothing. Nothing is impossible for God, is it? Amen. Nothing. One thing for certain with all these verses we just read is that if God is fighting for us or alongside with us, we cannot lose. As parents, we need to settle two things in this day and time. We need to be committed to God, and we need to be committed to our families. If there's any looseness in those commitments between, of God or our families, the enemy, what does he do? He tries to come in and divide and conquer our families, doesn't he? How many of you believe that the same God that fought for us in Nehemiah uh, is the same God we serve today? 
Amen, right? God doesn't change. We change, but God doesn't. We live in wild and crazy times. Uh, the Bible says in, but we can't be afraid to raise our kids in these times, right? The Bible says in Isaiah 54, 17, that no weapon against us shall prosper, right? We must build, we must put our trust in God and build our homes upon the rock who is Jesus Christ. And Nehemiah rebuilt the walls, and no matter what the enemy has done to our families, done to your homes, he rebuilt the walls, and portions of that wall still stand today. They stand today because there was a man who decided to fight for his family. We need to fight for our families, for our marriages, for our homes. And honestly, I had a hard time preparing this message, right, because the enemy kept reminding me kept reminding me that I'm divorced, that I have a broken family, right? And I know the Bible says God hates divorce, but I also know that the Bible says that he can renew and restore us, Amen. and I believe that's what God has done to me. Amen. The devil, he wants to destroy the church, and he knows the best way to destroy the church is by destroying our families. Let's take a look at some data. This is a study in 1996 about uh, the influence of parents attending church on faith of their children. When neither parent attends church, only 6% of kids wind up staying faithful to God. When it's just the mother, only 15% stay faithful to God. Now, when it's just the father, it jumps all the way up to 55% that stay faithful to God. And if both parents are united, 72% of kids remain faithful to God. Let's jump 20 years over. This is a, another similar study done in 2016. It says, according to data collected by Promise Keepers and Baptist Press, if a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, only one in 50 will become regular worshipers. If a father does go regularly, regularly, regardless of what the mother does, between two-thirds and three-quarters of their children will attend church as adults. If a father attends church irregularly, between half and two-thirds of their kids will attend with some regularity. If a mother does not go to church but a father does, a minimum of two-thirds of their children will end up attending church. In contrast, if a father does not and the mother does, on average, Two-thirds of their children will not attend church. When I, when I saw these stats, I, I took it a little personally. It hit me uh, uh, hard, and, and I, knew, I knew I had to fight for my family, right? Without uh, going into too much detail, when I was going through my custody for my kids, you know, there was one thing that I made very clear and I would not compromise on. And that's that my kids would be with me every Friday night and every Saturday morning. I would not settle for anything else less unless my kids could come to church with me on Saturdays. I, more than anything, just want to lead my family to heaven. And you know, how do you fight for your family? You know, sometimes I get asked, you're a manager at work. You make decent money, right? Why are you driving a... A car, old 2008 car with 231,000 miles on it. The AC don't work. The heat don't work half the time. And the truth is, if I have to pick between a fancy car and sending my kids to SVAE, Amen. I'm picking SVAE Amen. every time. I'm picking a school that will help me fight for my family and will teach them about Jesus and his love. Amen. And will help me fight for their salvation. You know, if you don't think raising kids to learn about God is important, I say beware. Listen to this verse, these verses. In Matthew 18, verses 4 through 6. And notice these words are in what color? And what does that mean? It means Jesus is speaking these words himself. It says, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Verse 6 almost gives me chills. It says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the death of the sea. 
The same exact passage as you can find it in Mark and in Luke. You think it's important to teach our kids about God? Let's go back to the question, how do we fight for our families? Sometimes we got to protect them from what's around, right? Sometimes we need to give our families, our kids, what they need. Look at these pictures, and it makes me think. What do my kids need? We need to help them take steps on that ladder up to heaven, right? One small step at a time, sometimes it's a sacrifice. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. What's this chapter known as? The faith chapter, right? And, and through this chapter, we can see a list of people that sometimes uh, I've heard referred to as the Faith Hall of Fame. And so I want to look at three of these people in this faith chapter and kind of dig in a little bit as to why they're here in this chapter. So verse 31, this one may surprise you a little bit. This is Rahab the harlot. Out of all people, she's in this faith hall of fame, right? It says, by faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe, when she had received the spies with peace. What else did she do? Let's look at Joshua 2, verse 12 and 13. So she hid the spies, and, and this is Rahab uh, speaking. It says, Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also show kindness to my father's house, and give me a true token, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. She saved her family, right? In verse 17, I'm sorry, Joshua 6, 17, you can see that the Israelites kept their promise. And the Lord kept his promise. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live. And she and all who are in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. The next person I want to look at uh, in uh, Hebrews is Hebrews 11, I'm sorry, yeah, 11.23. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. You know, sometimes, this is talking about Moses' parents more than Moses, I think, and sometimes as parents we need to hide our children, right? There's things that we need to hide from our children in this world, and eventually they're going to see some things, and eventually they're going to learn some things, but the longer we can hide things from our children and protect their innocence, I think the better off they're going to be. Amen. The last person on this Faith Hall of Fame I want to look at is one of my favorite Bible characters, Noah. It says, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his what? His household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to his faith. And so Noah being one of my favorite characters, I dug in a little deeper on him. And, and uh, if we go to Patriarchs and Prophets, page 98, paragraph 1, it says, God commanded Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me this, in this generation. Noah's warnings had been rejected by the world, but his influence and example resulted in blessings for his what? His family. And I love this part. As a reward for his faithfulness and integrity, God saved all the members of his family with him. Amen. What encouragement to parental fidelity or parental faithfulness, right? Amen. Because as a reward for his faithfulness and integrity, God saved his whole family. Amen. What does the Bible say the end of times are going to look like? days of Noah, right? What was going on in the days of Noah? Violence, worshiping other gods, pride, immorality, wickedness. 
Does this remind you of anything going on now? You know, because of Noah's faithfulness, his children were saved. And can you imagine, there were probably times when his children thought, is my dad going a little crazy here? I mean, he's building a massive boat in the desert where it doesn't rain. But boy, were they glad when the floods came that they had a faithful father and that they listened to their dad. And our children, too, will be glad when the time of judgment comes that they have faithful parents. Amen. Children, kids, teenagers, adults, if you have parents who love you, who teach you about Jesus and are a little bit strict sometimes, be grateful. Consider yourself lucky. Right? Let's always love and respect our parents. You know, I heard someone say recently, I think it was on the radio, he said, our job is not to get our kids to Harvard. Our job is to get our kids to heaven. Amen. Other ways to fight for your family. Pray for your families. I think of Job, right? God said he was blameless in his sight. And I think of Job in chapter 1 when it talks about him praying for his children, offering sacrifices for his children, each and every one of them by name. Listen to God's instructions. Here's a big one. Take them to church. Maybe send your kids to private school or home school. Right? Be a good example. Correct them and stand for the truth even when they get upset with you. And this one. What's important to them, make it important to you. Here's a picture of my favorite and most special place in my house. This is the wall in my room, and it's, Jolie counted yesterday, how many, how many things were up there? 131 of Jaden and Jolie's finest artwork, <laughs> their notes to me, their paintings, encouraging, encouraging stuff, and when I'm down, I just go to this wall, and I look, and I always feel better. I'm not worried about the wall and the holes in the wall and the paint that comes later. I'm worried about what's on the wall and the ones who gave me the stuff that's on the wall. It's important to them. It's important to me. In Isaiah 49, 25, it says this about the end of time. Thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and, pray of the ter and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with you. And I love this. And I will save your children. Amen. It's so important that we understand the impact that we have on our children. The story is told in the northeast of a famous attorney who had an alcohol problem. He was very successful and on his way to work every day to his law practice, he would walk down the streets of Chicago past the bar. And he would slip in for a morning drink and go to his office, and he did this every day. And one morning as he was walking, it was slightly falling, uh, the snow was slightly falling, and he heard a noise behind him. And when he turned around, he saw his six-year-old boy had somehow slipped out of the house and slipped out of the hands of his mother, and he saw his little six-year-old son stepping in every one of his footprints. The little boy was putting his foot in the big footprints of his dad, and the dad had just left in the freshly fallen snow. Suddenly, he, as he was standing outside of the bar, and he saw his son was stepping in every one of his footsteps. He was smitten with conviction, and he ran, and he scooped the boy up, and he took him home, and he put him in the arms of his mother, and he ran downstairs, and he got on his knees. He began to weep and to cry. And he looked up, and he said, Oh, God, Help me to never, ever again allow my footsteps to lead my children to a bar. But let my footprints always lead my children to you from this day forth. 
I want to ask you a question. Where are your footprints leading? Where are our footprints leading? If we're leading our children to Jesus, see, all that's going to matter when we are on our deathbed is where did my footprints lead them? If you're leading your children to Jesus, if you're leading them to serve him and to prioritize him above all, you're leaving the greatest legacy that any parent can ever leave their children. If you'll allow me to get a little personal here, I remember a conversation I had uh, with my dad a few years ago. I was going through a tough time in my life. I was going through my divorce. And I was talking to my dad and and he said, me and my, you know, Joel, me and your mom have been together for over 50 years, and we've never been divorced. He said, now with you, all four of my children have been divorced. And I could see the pain in his face, and I could hear the pain in his voice. And he said, what did I do wrong? And I don't like disappointing my parents. I just said, it's not your fault, Dad. Don't think like that that time I really didn't know what to say. But as I've studied for this sermon, I have a two-part answer for you, Dad. Number one, you did nothing wrong. You know, sometimes as parents, we think that we can make decisions for our kids. We think we can choose their spouses. That's not what we do as parents, right? Once we're grown up, our kids make our own decisions. So, Dad, you did nothing wrong. The second part, and more importantly, I want to tell you what you did right. You see that as I close my eyes and I look over at the footprints that you have left in your life. Those footprints always lead me to Jesus. Those footprints are why your four children are here today in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You have grandkids here because of your footprints. There's a Seventh-day Adventist Church in Winchester, in Woodstock, and a group forming in Front Royal because of your footprints. So I want to say thank you, Dad, for your footprints. Amen. And my mom, she's a prayer warrior. Amen. She prays all the time. She prays very specific prayers. She prays for her four kids, her 14 grandkids, specifically by name, all the time. And she prays for a lot of you right in here. So thank you, Mom, for being the prayer warrior that you are. You see, my parents are still fighting for their family today. You know, anyone who knows me knows I have a, a bad memory. I see Melody laughing because, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a wonderful childhood, but it's just a lot of details I just don't remember. And, and Melody and Jeannie specifically always uh, asking me stuff. You remember when we were kids, this? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't. But I had a wonderful childhood. But let me tell you what I do remember. I remember that every Saturday morning we were at church. I never had to ask whether we were going to church or not because I knew the answer. If there was a Friday evening Vespers, we were at church. Saturday afternoon program, we were at church. Week of prayer, seminar, if it was at the church, we were there. I remember Sabbath school songs. Thank you so much to our Sabbath school teachers Amen. who are helping us fight for our kids. I remember memory verses. I remember studying with Alejandro John chapter 15 about the true vine when I prepared for my baptism with Melody. I remember those things. And there was times when as a kid that I looked bored at church and maybe I was half asleep. Kind of like Jaden sometimes, right? <laughs> and I thought I wasn't listening. I wasn't paying attention, but the Holy Spirit was working in my heart. Amen. And there are times now when I'm in church where I remember, I'm like, man, I remember that from when I was a kid because my parents brought me to church. 
Our jobs is to bring our kids and grandkids to church and let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. You know, as a kid, and my mom will tell me, tell you, I was a really shy kid, right? And I never wanted to be up here. I think she would force me, they would force me sometimes to say poems because I couldn't sing, the rest of the family could sing, so they would sing and they'd force me to say poems up here. <laughs> yep, you had to be involved, right? But what changed? What changed is that I became a father and God has spoken to me and says, well, being, being a father is big responsibilities. I want to be an example to my kids. I want my footprints to always lead them to Jesus. I want my footprints to lead them to Sabbath school and to the Seventh-day Adventist church. There's a song I remember singing as a kid in Sabbath school. Oh, be careful little feet where you go. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Anybody remember that song? I think we need an adult version of that song. Oh, be careful big feet where you go. Oh, be careful big eyes what you see. Because where the big feet go, the little feet are going to follow. Where the big eyes go, the little eyes are going to follow. And where the big heart is devoted, the little hearts are going to follow. Where are your footprints leading? Some of you may have children that are addicted to drugs or alcohol, fight for them. Some of you may have children who don't go to church or want nothing to do with God, fight for them. Some of you may have children that are strange and they, for whatever reason, don't even talk to you. Keep fighting for them. Some of your kids may be depressed or anxious, fight for them. Some of your children may have even passed away and the devil has devastated your family. Fight for what's left. Rebuild the walls off of what is left. Don't give up on your family. If you raise your children in church, and even if you didn't, in Romans 5.20 it says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but if your children have to ask you each week, are we going to church? Are we going to church? That's a sign that our footprints are not leading in the right direction. It's too easy to make excuses not to go to church. I'm too tired. It's too cold. It's too hot. It's raining. It's raining. I'm not going to go to church. This is a church in the Philippines. After a flood, you think they're making excuses? Take your children to church. If you bring your family to church and you've done your best to teach your children about Jesus, you don't need to be perfect, but if you've done your, your best to have God's presence in your home, there's something that will get on your family that they will never be able to get away from. The Holy Spirit will continue to work in their lives. He did it for me. Many years I didn't go to church, but the Holy Spirit kept working in me and my family kept fighting for me. Today I want to challenge us to open our Bibles and to claim and declare the promises of God. And today we talked about a great one, that if you will fight for your family, our God will fight for us. You ever heard... Someone, a parent say, I would die for my child. I've said it myself. Listen to this quote from Matt Beadreau. I would die for my child. He says, I believe you, but would you live for them? Would you get yourself healthy? Would you eliminate distractions? Would you lead them more intentionally? You only have to die once, but you live every day. Do that. As you look around you now, what do you see? I see my Valley Fellowship family. We are family. Let's fight for each other. Let's pray for each other. 
we do that, I believe with all my heart that God will fight for us. My desire today is that we fight for our families, that we leave behind footprints that lead others to Jesus, and that we ourselves would follow the footprints of Jesus.